uh, it's my uh, pleasure, uh, great pleasure, to essentially kind of introduce the first uh, Buddhist forum lecture of this entire year, because in term one I was on sabbatical. I thought I would do one, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> Uh, and so it's only the first uh, lecture now in term two, organized, of course, by the Center uh, for Buddhist Studies and uh, sponsored to enable us also to have a seminar by the Gensu Foundation uh, now. And we will have a program of four lectures uh, this year, two in uh, term two and one in, uh, or two in term three. Uh, in May. Uh, and uh, I was very glad that uh, Markus Fieberg agreed to come uh, to uh, present uh, on his kind of more recent research that he is working on since he kind of returned to Vienna uh, a year ago. Isn't it? Yeah, well, since uh, since uh, uh, May last year, so yeah. yeah. So he so has actually studied in Vienna at uh, the Institute of South Asian Tibetan and Buddhist Studies at the University of Vienna. He has uh, then moved to Heidelberg <laughs> to work for the the what is it called Cluster Asia Europe at uh, as a kind of assistant professor to the chair of Buddhist studies. Uh, and his kind of research goes in different areas, of course, Buddhist philosophy, uh, Tibetan intellectual history, much more about more recent uh, Tibetan past, uh, especially also Sikkim, things I don't know much about. But we essentially met again when he decided to return to Vienna uh, to uh, do uh, kind of continue the research of the country and dungeon studies project in Vienna. And actually he joined last year uh, at uh, a research trip that I organized in, as part of the Tibetan Buddhist Monastery Collections today, uh, documentation to continue the work on the Namgyal Kanjur that will uh, found like two years before, started documenting uh, another year before that. Uh, and uh, uh, it's in this kind of general area that he will also present uh, some of his first findings, I guess, uh, today yeah. on that particular subject. Yeah? And uh, it may be interesting for you to know, Namgyal, uh, Kanjua uh, is, or it's actually not a full Kanjua, it's uh, just two sections, the Prajnaparamita and the, the Sutra section, and we'll also plan a publication together on that, because he already finished the catalog of it, more or less, uh, did studies on its relationship uh, to other canonical literature, in the Tibetan world, and I'll study the illuminations of that conjure because it's the earliest conjure or earliest sections of conjure that has an entire kind of iconographic program planned for it. And so it's the earliest example for that. And so uh, I'm very pleased to have him here also to discuss our own project over the next days. Uh, yeah, and so without further delaying, uh, he will talk about off the mainstream, tra tracing a network of sutra collections across the Himalayas, and that comes directly out of the Namgyal Conjure, because one of the two collections is a sutra collection. Yeah. Right. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Um, many thanks for the introduction, um, and also a warm welcome um, to all of you from my side. I feel quite honored, um, really, to, to be able to speak to you at this special venue. Um, and of course, I would like to thank Christian for inviting me in the first place, and then also Emma for taking care about all these practical matters of bringing me here. Um, as Christian has said, my talk will t bring us to the high Himalayas, to different places, uh, mostly to Mustang, Dolpo, and also a bit to Ladakh. 
Um, it will take us to places that are rather secluded, that are rather off the beaten track, so that kind of might be one way to interpret the first half of the title. Um, there's also a more substantial interpretation to it because we will be dealing with textual collections, specifically with sutra collections um, of a rather special kind. So these are massive um, textual collections. In that sense, they're also quite similar in scope to other collections, to canonical collections, to conjures. Um, but if we look at them more closely, they're also quite different in nature. Um, in comparison to conjures, um, what we call in conjure studies, the mainstream traditions of canonical literature. In order to make that point clear, I think I will have to start off with some more general um, background, with some more general explanations on conjure studies. And I think it will also be good to start off um, by explaining some of the background of our current research project at the University of Vienna that Christian had mentioned. So in this project, I've been joining um, Helmut Tauscher and Bruno Lenné. They actually have been doing um, research on conjure studies for the past 20 years in the framework of different research projects. Um, all of them were financed by the um, Austrian Science Fund. And now we kind of started to um, um, establish a very loose umbrella term for this uh, larger lasting interest, namely, namely the Tibetan Manuscript Project Vienna. In the past, they have been working mostly in the Western Himalayas, specifically in Ladakh and Sanska. And now with the current project, there's a shift towards the Central Himalayas, and we'll tell you in a minute uh, why that is the case. In the past, uh, Helmut Tausch and Bruno, Bruno Lenné, they have been locating, digitizing, also cataloging um, quite a number of conjures and canonical um, collections in Ladakh and Sanska, right? And by doing that also contributed to preserving um, cultural heritage and the literary um, heritage of Tibetan Buddhism. So this is one aspect that's important, um, preservation, but then also um, making these important materials accessible. Right? Um, for that reason then a database has been created, the Resources of Conjure and Tanjure Studies. has been produced mostly by Bruno Lenné. Um, and with the database, two things are important. First of all, it should make things um, openly available, right? Open access um, is important for us on a personal level. That's an idea we support. Um, it's also an idea that is guaranteed um, through the guidelines of our funding institutions, yeah? from the um, Austrian Science Fund. It's very clear that everything we do should be openly accessible. The second issue then is uh, a long-term um, perspective. We would like to make this a long-term affair. And this is an, an issue that is much more complicated because as you can see, um, so far everything depends on individual projects which, with a, a very limited um, duration. Um, when we do all of that in order to foster philological and historical research on Tibetan conjures, not just for ourselves, but really um, for making this material um, openly available to a, a global academic community. When we speak about Tibetan conjures, then the plural is really important. As Peter Skilling has noted already in an early article, an article that was published more than 20 years ago, um, historically it's not justified to speak of the Tibetan canon, of the Tibetan conjure. Yeah, that's not what we have, that's a construct. What we have, what we find on the ground, is just a multitude of conjures that were produced at different places. This is for once a political reason. There never was a centralized control over the production of all of these conjures. And there's also a religious significance to it, a religious reason for that. The conjure is important as a religious object, as a symbolic object. It represents for once um, the speech aspect of the Buddha, but then also the Buddhist teaching, the Buddha Dharma in its entirety, right? And for these reasons, um, Tibetan monasteries, ideally, they would struggle to get hold of a copy of a Tibetan can uh, of a kanjur to be placed in its uh, main shrine room. Historically, we also know um, not many monasteries were able to do so, um, but uh, at least kind of this ideal is there. And for this reason, um, really a, a great number of kanjurs were produced, um, much more um, for example, in comparison to Tanjurs, right? That's a common division in, in uh, Tibetan canonical literature. We have one body of literature, the Kanjur, the translation of the speeches that are connected to the Buddha. 
and then the Tanja, the translation of the treatises composed by Indian authors. To illustrate the multitude of conjures that we have, um, I would like to use this slide. It's basically a screenshot from an old version um, of our website, of our archive. Uh, it's more than a year old. It's not uh, correct anymore. It has changed in the meantime. Um, my ambition was not to be very precise, but rather kind of to show you at one grasp um, how many conjures we know of. Yeah? Currently, we know of something between 50 to 16 uh, conjures and major canonical collections. It depends, of course, kind of what we count as a conjure and what then is a canon canonical collection. <clears throat> when we look at um, all of these conjures, and ideally in a, in a kind of long-term perspective, we would like to include material information, detailed uh, catalogs on all of these conjures into our database. So from that is very clear, this is very kind of long-term um, goal that we would like to achieve. When we look at these conjures, um, when we look at their differences, and I think it makes, se it makes sense to speak about their differences in three um, very rough and fundamental uh, ways in which they are different. Yeah? First of all, in terms of which works are included or excluded in a specific collection. Yeah? This is also an issue of size. So historically, um, conjures tend uh, to grow. So kind of, uh, first of all, what we had in, in uh, Tibet uh, were smaller Domang collections. Domang literally translates as many sutras. Um, so kind of these sutra collections we had, um, later then they developed in something that Helmut Tausche called uh, protokanjus. Um, major, bigger collections, um, but um, not fully structured. Fully structured uh, conjures then developed in the 14th century with the model um, developed by Bhutan Rinchenjob, famous uh, Tibetan intellectual that kind of developed uh, this uh, first systematic structure of a conjure that then took off and was uh, very much influential over the entire Tibetan cultural sphere. Um, then the second difference is um, how these works um, are ordered, yeah? in which uh, sequence they are placed in a specific collection or how they form um, different subgroups in a collection. And then um, thirdly, and that's a much more fine-grained uh, um, perspective and it needs a much more fine-grained analysis, um, the differences um, on the level of the structure and the text of an individual work, right? Um, <clears throat> all of these differences between the different conjures and also, of course, um, historical material that we find, for example, in the colophones of these collections or that we find in historiographic materials, in namtas, in biographies, and so forth, have been used to kind of understand the historical um, development of conjures um, in a large scale. Um, and there's a very common um, distinction that is drawn in conjure studies to distinguish these different conjures. There's a major, major distinction in uh, the form of two mainstream traditions. So one is the Tsalpa tradition, that is actually the tradi tradition that uh, most of the conjures that we commonly use nowadays, um, um, these belong to this tradition, yeah? like the, the Dagi Kanon, um, the uh, Peking Kanon, the Chona, and so forth. All of that belongs to the Tsalpa tradition. Um, that goes back to a manuscript conjure that was produced in the 14th century in Tsalgungtang in central Tibet. Then there's the other mainstream tradition, the Tempangma tradition. Um, also, that goes back to a manuscript conjure. It was produced also in central Tibet in the 1430s um, at Gyantse. And then there's a third group. Um, yeah, there's a third group, what we call a mixed group. It's basically a conflation between these two mainstream traditions, um, such as the Lhasa and the Natan Kanjus. And then everything that you see below that is here labeled with these kind of um, re regional tags, yeah? um, these are Kanjus that are not well studied yet. And about these, we don't know so much. But there's the basic assumption in conjure studies that any, for any conjure that we find, it's either um, <clears throat> part or it's, it's related, directly related to any of the two mainstream traditions. Or if that is not the case, um, then it uh, should be conceived of as something that's called a local tradition, a local conjure. So that's a term um, that was coined by Helmut Eimer. Right? It should uh, signify 
um, local collections that were produced at a specific place from local materials and also um, had no further reaching impact um, in, in, in literal and textual terms. They were not part of any larger textual networks. Um, and this very basic assumption is the basic assumption that we question in the current phase of our research project. So Helmut Tausch and Bruno Lenné, a couple of years back, they noted some indications in, in scattered collections in Western Tibet um, that indicated that there could be a larger textual network um, that spreads out from the Western Himalayas and perhaps to the Central Himalayas. Um, and that's basically what we do in the current project phase. We are tra trying to trace this network and kind of the first findings um, of this project um, will be what I will be presenting today. Right. In order to do so, um, we need to um, locate and uh, digitize and work on new collections. So we continue a bit with the work in Ladakh. We also um, work a bit in Bhutan. Um, here we are in a quite uh, lucky position. We don't need to uh, get there ourselves. But there was a project by uh, Karma Punso in the framework of the Endangered Archives project um, under the heading of the British Library, um, under which actually uh, many collections were gathered uh, and digitized in Bhutan. Um, and this material was made accessible. And now we can use this material. And then most importantly, um, we work in the central Himalayas. And that's also the focus of my own research. Um, in Dolpo and in Mustang. And here I'm also not alone, as Christian has said at the beginning. Um, I was very lucky in summer 2017, um, Christian invited me to join him um, on this research trip um, to Upper Mustang. Um, specifically, we were heading to this monastery of Namgyal. It's located in far up in the north of, um, of uh, Upper Mustang, very close to the capital Lomantang. Um, also very close to the Tibetan border. Um, <clears throat> and in these areas, um, Christian was documenting different monastic objects, different monastic collections. And he noted already a couple of years back, um, so he was looking um, into um, all sorts of objects, yeah, in, in, into statues, tankas, musical instruments, but also into books. Um, and he noted um, at this specific place in Namgyal, that there's important collection of about um, 200 um, old Tibetan books. He made a first documentation of that. And um, among these volumes, there is one strata of texts, um, 43 volumes, which is significant, significantly older than the rest of the textual material. And Christian, he noted immediately the importance of this material, and he started um, slowly digitizing it. And then in summer 2017, um, we were kind of able to um, digitize the entire material, uh, meaning um, digitize every single folio of these um, 200, uh, not 243 uh, volumes. Right. Um, that's a sample manuscript of this collection. I don't know if Christian has uh, showed you uh, samples of these before. Um, you can see immediately why an art historian is interested in this kind of material. Yeah? They are really um, immensely, immensely beautifully illuminated. Um, we find illuminations um, on every first folio and every last folio of every single volume. So for Christian, this provides him with a rich body of art historical material to work with. Um, I should also say that in stylistic terms, all of these volumes are quite similar. right? Um, and then I, of course, I look at this material from a different perspective. Um, for once, I look at this from a manuscript studies perspective. And secondly, also from a conjure studies perspective, looking uh, into the contents of these manuscripts. And kind of I will start off, first of all, um, discussing some of the manuscript features of these volumes. Um, one of the immediate um, gains of doing this is that it gives us uh, a clear estimation where to place these manuscripts in time. This is important because uh, we literally we have uh, otherwise no material kind of no historiographic material uh, that would help us in this in this regard. <clears throat> when we um, do that, we can discuss different features. We can first of all, for example, discuss codicological features. We can, for example, um, look uh, in which way these folios were numbered, yeah, in the system of pagination that is used in these manuscripts. 
Um, and I don't know kind of how many of you are Tibetan studies people and kind of, um, you know, if, if you could immediately understand um, what I'm talking about if you can't read the Tibetan, but I hope it will be clear nevertheless. Um, so there's one system of pagination that we find in these, uh, it's known from um, other older Western Tibetan manuscripts, where the, the hundreds of manuscripts, uh, of the hundreds uh, that are written on the um, margins of the folios um, are indicated through signs of crosses or X's. There's one system that you find here. Um, you find a second system, um, for that I should uh, use the mouse, you find a, set, a second system where the hundreds are also indicated um, through a subscribed letter under the volume letter um, that also indicates the hundreds. It's a very specific system. Um, in in uh, other studies, uh, there's a study by Christina Shera Schaub, who studied um, older Western Tibetan manuscripts. Um, she came up with a certain typology. This would be in the system, it would be a type 3A and type 3B. It, it, it's, it's really something that kind of you know, gives us, uh, uh, in comparison with other manuscript collections, it gives us uh, a clearer estimation of the time of these manuscripts. Um, <clears throat> we also find a certain way of Ornament, ornamentation that is found in these manuscripts. Um, you find these older forms, archaic forms of ornamentation on the top of a page with this um, single wave, it's called a goyik or yigo, so a letterhead basically, um, that is found in there. We find also something, um, you find an element that looks like an upside down heart. If any of you has seen something like that ever before, I would be quite curious because I've not seen that before in any of um, the other manuscripts I, I looked into. I think it's, not, it's clearly not a, a heart, it's just a similar uh, shape, but it's upside down. Um, but um, these are features that are easily distinguished from later manuscripts, and that's what you see below here. So these are similar signs, but they're also clearly different with these um, two-wave uh, curls. Right? And these are taken from the same volumes, but from uh, manuscripts that were replaced at a, a later time, and this is very clear. We also find um, orthographic features. So all of these features, um, they are commonly subsumed under the label of Old Tibetan Orthography. Um, there's a certain form of uh, writing a reverse uh, gigo, it's called a gilok, that's here. Uh, that's the reverse form, and that's the later standard Tibetan form, right? Um, we find um, a mayata, that's the yata sign, um, that's missing in, in, in later standard Tibetan forms. Um, also, that's a letter that's called tatrak, um, that's also missing in later Tibetan forms. <clears throat> and a achung suffix, uh, it's this letter here that we find uh, in combination with a vowel ending. It's only f uh, found in this early strata of texts. Um, and you can also see, of course, um, that kind of these earlier forms and these later forms are just placed next to each other. And I think most decisive in determining the age of the manuscripts are paleographic features. Um, there's something um, that is called horizontal ligatures. It's a certain way uh, in Tibetan uh, language uh, consonants are clustered together. And when they're written, um, they're usually clustered together in the vertical way. In older Tibetan forms, they're clustered together in a more horizontal way. Yeah? Um, you see this in cases like that, in cases like Sapatapa, Ratsatatsa, or Satatata. Um, you see it very nicely here. Um, so that would be the old form, that would be the newer form, right? One is more vertical and the other is more horizontal. Um, we could even go down to investigating the shape of individual letters. And also there are significant differences. Um, I've just chosen um, these two samples, these two letters, because there the difference is uh, most easily recognized. So the, the letters on the gray background, um, these are older letters. You see uh, that for these letter K um, and K, um, kind of this part forms a very strict triangle, right? The kind of the lines touch at one point at the top. Um, the writing on the black background is from a later manuscript, I think from the 15th century. Um, there the letters don't do that. They're open. The lines are open at the top. So we do all of that in order to determine the age. Um, I feel it's quite safe to say that these manuscripts that we have in Namgyal um, are produced at the beginning, beginning of the 14th century, um, tentatively. But I think uh, 
I'm quite sure they were not produced later than that. Um, <clears throat> having a, a substantial um, collection of canonical literature from the 14th century is something that is really sensational. Yeah? That's, uh, the, the other collections that we have as uh, physically existing manuscripts, um, these date to the early 17th century earliest, something like the Van Likandje, for example. Right? We'll go back 300 years in time. Yeah, that's uh, kind of, that, that just really, uh, that in itself is sensational. Um, but um, rather than the mere dating of the manuscript, I think actually the, the content um, is also something which is uh, very interesting. And um, for analyzing the content then, um, we make heavy use of our database. Yeah? In this database, as I've said, we kind of try to um, include information of something like 50 plus um, conjures and canonical collections. And the mo more material we include in this database, um, the more easy it gets to identify any new title that we have. And also the more reliable gets this identification. So that's the first thing that what we do with any collection we find. We identify the text via the text titles. Um, once we have done that, we have an electronic catalog and we kind of can do an automized comparison of the title sequence. I will show you later um, what that looks like. If we have the time for doing that, um, we are quite precise in, in the way we do the catalogs. Um, we also um, take note of the chapter headings and even down to the bumpo markers. That's like a kind of a paragraph marker in, in these kind of texts. When we do that, we can also compare the structure of these texts with the structure of other texts. And of course, also we would like to make accessible the, the, um, this, the original scans, the manuscripts itself. Um, and uh, by having these, then of course, uh, we can kind of uh, work on the full text, do a more, fi uh, more fine-grained uh, philological work. But of course, this is uh, kind of very um, laborious uh, um, uh, work. <clears throat> Having done that for, the, for these 43 volumes in Namgyal, um, I can say that uh, what we have in Namgyal roughly looks like that. Right? Um, we have basically two sets of texts. Um, one is a set here in blue that's called in Tibetan Bum. Bum is simply the Tibetan uh, term for 100,000. So it's an uh, abbreviation for the Sanskrit uh, title Shatta uh, Sahasrika Prajna Paramita. It's a perfection of wisdom texts in 100,000 verses. And as kind of this number indicates, it's a huge text. Um, it spreads out over these 14 volumes and it's more or less complete. And every single of these volumes has something between 300 to 400 pages. Right. That's just one single text. In terms of comparison, therefore, it's not so interesting. Um, the other part of the collection is much more interesting. It's uh, labeled as uh, Dode, literally translates as a sutra collection. <clears throat> it's uh, structured in 30 volumes, according to the 30 letters of the Tibetan alphabet. Um, we have two volumes that are missing, volume um, 16, volume Ma and volume Ha. These two in gray, these are missing. Um, the others are more or less complete. We have one duplicated volume, volume 8. <clears throat> but here the duplicated volume and the, what we consider the original volume, um, these are quite similar in content. But uh, one volume is a bit more damaged than the other, and we assume that for this reason it was then exchanged. <clears throat> In these volumes then, and for the sutra section, we have something between 300 and 350 uh, folios per volume. Um, in terms of text, we have anything between one text or ten texts up to 63 texts in one volume. Altogether, we have 325 texts. And these um, 325 texts, they are ordered in a specific sequence. And once we have this catalog, we can compare this sequence with the sequence of other textual collections. Um, <clears throat> that's actually a method that was developed by Bruno Lenné a couple of years back when he was um, investigating the contents of diff different conjures. And uh, that's a method that I find quite useful um, for various reasons. It works like that. So we do an electronic comparison. Um, the first thing is, get, uh, is uh, the first thing we get is a, a comparative uh, table. This table is then rendered into a graph that looks like that. 
What you see here in red is the red line here, the, the uh, sequence, the order of the Dage Kanja, of the Dage Kanon, which is the, like the, the Kanja that is mostly used um, in Kanja studies. And for every single text, then, the relative placement in the Namgyal collection is given. That means if uh, one text, yeah, if one text is placed earlier in Namgyal, the graph would go up. If another text is placed later, the graph would go down. If the text is not there in Namgyal, then there would be a gap. And when we then now look at this distribution, and of course we, we, kind of, we, we need these tables in order to be able to, to interpret uh, the graph, um, it actually tells us a lot about the content um, of a collection. Very quickly, if we, kind of, we, if we know how uh, these collections are structured. For example, we know um, that these gaps are to be found in specific places. So we know, for example, the Vinaya section is completely missing in Namgyal. We also know the Pratna Paramita section is almost completely missing apart one text. This is the Shatta Sahasrika Pratna Paramita. We know also, these are the gaps here, um, that most of the texts that are included um, in the Ratnakuta collections and Avatamsaka uh, collections are not there. We also see this kind of would be the sutra section of the kanja, of the Dari kanja. That would be the tantra section of the uh, Dari kanja. So we see, even uh, though this, uh, this collection uh, is termed as a sutra section, there's actually a lot of tantric material included in this Namgyal material. Quite surprisingly also, um, this is also the tantra section, um, none of the texts of the first 10 volumes of the tantra section of the Dari canon is included there, right? The, the, the tantric texts that we find in Namgyal are mostly Dharanis, no tantras as such. Right. So that's one thing. It tells us something about the content. Um, the other thing is uh, it tells us something about relationships. If the, the order, if the graph, the comparative graph is so irregular, we can be very sure that there were no historic relationships between these two collections in terms of how they are ordered. Um, it's important to understand the point. It's just comparing the order. It does not say anything about the text themselves. But of course, we kind of assume if there's a closer relationship in terms of order, then that it might be an indication for closer relationships also on the textual level. <clears throat> I come back to this comparative method later. Um, I just want to mention also kind of bits and pieces of, uh, kind of unusual things that I noted. Um, unusual only if we talk in, in terms of mainstream kanja traditions, right? As I said before, in the, in, in, uh, there's this division between kanja and tenjur. Uh, so one would be the collection ascribed to the Buddha and the other one to human authors. Here in the sutra section of Namgyal, we find also two texts um, that were composed by human authors. That's the Chattakamala by Aryashura and the um, Sapta Kumarika Avadana by Gopadatta. That's highly unusual for conjures in the mainstream traditions. It's not unusual for uh, the textual connections of that network. It's also found in similar uh, collections that I will talk uh, about later. Um, yeah, the other point I mentioned already. There are also some works which we, um, which we don't know so far. Um, there are altogether six titles uh, which I was not able to spot in any of the main, um, in, in any of the main uh, kanjas of the mainstream traditions. Um, it's a rather um, big Mahayana Sutra. Um, it's secondly a praise to Buddha Maitreya, uh, then another smaller praise, then another short Mahayana Sutra, and two small Dharanis. Um, about the first text, uh, I was a bit, it's actually. Uh, in, in the preparation for the talk, I was getting a bit suspicious. I thought, how could it be that such a big sutra is not found in, uh, in, the, in the other kanjas? And then I looked more closely and I found it's just the title that is not found. I checked for the text, uh, a rather similar version is actually found in the, uh, the Dari Kanon. They list as uh, 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 text number 134, um, but it's listed under a completely different title. For the other texts, I'm, I'm very sure, I, che checks, I checked also for the texts. Um, these are not included in any of the major collections that we know so far. So it's quite important. So um, <clears throat> these collections here in the Himalayan borderlands, um, they might be seen as treasures really, um, where texts are preserved that otherwise we would not be aware of. Right.
um, so we could kind of play this comparative game. Um, and that's a game that, uh, since it's automized, we can do this very fast and easily. And it kind of um, tells us where to look more closely. And um, um, you see, if we do another comparison with another catalog, we, we see something interesting. So some, the parallel placement for this uh, uh, later section here. Um, that's a comparison with the early Mustang catalog. Um, the early Mustang catalog is based on a manuscript that was found in, in the Mugu district, rather close to, to Dolpo and uh, to Mustang. It's also found, at least a fragment of it, is found in the Namta of another uh, rather famous figure. It's found in Namta of uh, Ngochen Kunga Sangpo. Um, Ngochen was a figure who was very active in the Mustang area in the 15th century, in um, kind of sponsoring and heading a couple of kanja producing projects. We don't know whether this catalog corresponds to any collection, but we assume that at least this was the case in earlier times. Right? Um, so we have these parallels here in the later part, and these parallels are easily understood if you kind of map on um, the, the, the contents of the, uh, kind of the, the, the sections of the early Mustang uh, um, Kanjur. So we see these uh, similarities are only for one specific section, namely for a sec section that is called in the early Muslim catalog the sutra section. Yeah, Do Silbupa, various sutras. <clears throat> we see again, there's tantric material from um, Dharanis, Sung is the Tibetan uh, term for Dharani, um, from these Dharanis collections, but there, is, there are no parallels here in terms of placement. Um, also, nothing from the Gyu section, from the tantra section is found in Yamgil. <clears throat> when we um, first noticed that, then our first idea was um, that actually um, what we have in, in Namgyal must be seen as a fragment of a kanju, right? We basically thought it's, it's a sutra section of a kanju, um, and the, the other uh, parts were, were either never produced fully um, or they went missing over time. That was kind of our first instinct. And that still would be a possible explanation. I think another explanation um, is more likely. Um, and that has to do with um, rather recent findings, with findings um, from um, the, another expedition um, to Dolpo um, in um, last summer, in summer 2018. Um, what we now assume, and I will explain that later in more detail, we assume that um, the Namgyal collection that existed actually earlier before kanjus, kind of in this fully fledged kanjus in this 14th century uh, Bhutan model, before these ideas were introduced to Mustang. Right? As I said before, um, Ngochen Kunga Sangpo, he was um, very influential in that regard. He came to this area in the 15th century um, only. Um, and then the idea would be then that collections like the Namgyal uh, collection then kind of would be incorporated into these conjures. Um, that would be also one way to um, interpret um, some of the comments that we find in the biographies of Ngo Chen, right? So that it's it said that uh, when he came to uh, Mostang in the 15th century, there was no complete conjure available at that place. Um, and for that reason, he had to kind of um, um, produce a new um, kanja set, and he was taking um, the, the different parts of what's supposed to form a full kanja um, from different areas, right? The tantra section he, he took from Sakya, and the other sections um, he took from other places. Yeah? It could just be that uh, uh, Namgyal was one of these places where he got a uh, substantial collection which he could uh, incorporate into a fully fledged um, kanja. Right, <clears throat> as I've said, kind of these indications um, came from another expedition from last year. Last year we traveled um, to Dolpo, it's very close to Mustang, um, again far up um, in the north um, in a town called Biche, very close to the Tibetan border, but accessible only from the Nepalese side. Um, it's actually a rather long trek. It needs an, an, a week-long trek uh, to get to that place. Um, and there's uh, one rather famous monastery at this place, uh, Nessa Gompa or Nessa Monastery. 
Um, <clears throat> and this place um, houses a real treasure of Tibetan manuscripts. Yeah, this house is altogether um, a treasure of about um, 640 old Tibetan manuscripts. What you see here on the picture is just a third of the entire library. And this treasure was noted um, already um, yeah, more than 50 years back, 15 years back, um, by Klaus Dieter Mattes, but also by Amy Heller. And Amy Heller, in 2009, she produced the first catalog of this collection. <clears throat> and in this uh, catalog, she made clear that what we have um, stored here at one place are actually the collections of three different monasteries. We have one collection that belongs to Lang Monastery of 98 volumes, and we have two um, smaller, uh, two uh, substantial collections, um, one which is called a Nessa Kanjur, um, a canonical collection there of 103 volumes, and a massive collection of various um, sets of this Bum literature of 361 volumes, and then a sm um, 69 volumes, and then a, a smaller collection from a temple called Serkang of 71 volumes. In 2013 and 2014 then, the RKTS project um, approached the head lama of that monastery and he was asked if he could uh, provide a, a fo photograph, a scans um, of a canonical set from that monastery. And he agreed and he did so. Um, and he delivered us with a set um, of manuscripts of 88 volumes. And it looked roughly like a kanju, like a kanju we know from the 14th century in this Bhutan model. Um, what he did, however, and that's something we noted only when, he, when we traveled to the place uh, and spoke to the Lama, what he did is uh, that he had this model of a Bhutan kanju, of a fully fledged kanju in mind. And then he took, he chose from all of these uh, volumes at his disposal to create such a kanju, right? So in, in historical terms, it was a completely artificial collection that never belonged together uh, in itself. Of course, also these, all of these manuscripts are uh, historically close related, but they never formed uh, uh, this single collection. But this is something uh, we noted only when we were there, were there at this place. Um, but then we noted um, among these volumes that were photographed by the Lama, um, there were some volumes which uh, clearly pointed out that there are some um, connections, uh, some uh, structures set up that looked very similar to what we have found in Namgyal. And all of these volumes were coming from one single collection, and this was the Lang collection of 98 volumes. And then um, last summer we um, digitized this entire collection completely about uh, 25 volumes we had already, so we uh, digitized uh, the rest of, of the collection. <clears throat> also there we have a first catalog, um, and you can see immediately, so it's a very similar st uh, structure setup to what we've seen in Namgyal. Um, it's also a section that is titled as a sutra section, Dode Gyepa, so an extensive sutra collection. It's also structured in 30 volumes. Um, in most, on most of the volumes, you will find on the cover page, you will find an indication, this volume is part of the sutra uh, section. These are the volumes marked here in purple. Um, there are some volumes which where the, the first uh, cover page is missing. But I assume, kind of based on stylistic considerations, but also um, in looking into the contents, I assume that all of these volumes belong to that uh, one um, collection. It's complete, and you see also we have more texts than we have in Namgyal. Yeah, we have 421 texts. Um, so we have many more texts, and this is easily explained because uh, in this one volume which is missing in Namgyal, volume 29, we have um, 135 texts in this single volume alone. Um, it's a volume full of rather obscure and very small dharanis, um, and many of these uh, are not identified. We see the same parallel developments if we do this uh, automated comparison. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we see very significant uh, parallels in the order. You can also see that individual um, uh, texts are placed differently, or you can also see that individual volumes are placed differently. But over and all, kind of, it's, it, there's a very clear connection. There's one major gap, and of course, this gaps, uh, gap is easily explained. Yeah, it's just this one single volume, volume 29, which is missing uh, in the Namgyal collection. 
can also do again the comparison to early Mustang. We see the same parallel in the Sutra section. And we see again um, that just the, the lung collection is richer in textual material. And all of these additional texts are coming from these uh, Sungdu and Sungbum from these um, Dharani sections. Right. Um, <clears throat> so doing that, we can be very sure that there are very close connections between these two, uh, these three um, um, uh, collections, right? Uh, Namgyal, um, Lang collection, and also the early Mustang catalog. What we also know is that there are equally close connections to other collections in Ladakh. Yeah? Um, this is something that was investigated in earlier times um, already by Helmut Tausch and by Bruno Lenné. Um, there are um, a couple of fragmentary collections. Uh, for once, at Hemis Monastery, and the other place is uh, at Basco. <clears throat> um, I will not kind of discuss any of that in detail, but just kind of to, to show you at, at one um, glance again that you see there are these um, important uh, parallels in terms of how these collections are ordered. Um, Helmut Tausch and Bruno Lenné, they have written an article about that in 2005. Um, but they, of course, were only able to speak about these collections and not about this uh, new material from Namgyal uh, and Lang. Right. Kind of, uh, slowly, I would kind of come, like to come to an end. Um, and for the end, I would like to come back um, to the question I started discussing earlier, um, namely the, the question really whether what we find here, what we found in Namgyal and in Lang specifically, um, whether it's possible to conceive of that material as being fragments of conjures, or whether really this should be seen as kind of forming an independent form of canon or kind of a different form of canon that we simply were not aware of. And as I said, I kind of I tend much more now to the to the second option, um, and I do so based on a closer investigation of this material from Lang. So you remember at Lang we had 98 volumes. It's a very conspicuous size of volumes, number of uh, volumes in in kanji terms. Um, most of the kanjis we know of they contain something about 100 volumes, and that also was the first instinct. We thought. We expected to find a conjure there, a fragment of a conjure. Um, if we now look more closely, no conjure will emerge. There is no conjure to be found there. What we find instead is a clear focus on these two elements, on sutra volumes, door volumes, and on boom volumes, on pratya paramita sets. So of these 98 volumes, we have 61 sutra volumes. <coughs> Before I've just spoken about this one single set, the set here in the middle, yeah? this one set which is complete of 30 volumes. It's called Dori Kepa. And I roughly place this in time tentatively uh, really in the 14th to the 15th century. Well, and also we have one set which is earlier. It's just a fragment. It's six volumes that could be produced something like 50 to 100 years earlier, I think. And then we have another set, and that's almost complete, um, of 25 volumes. And these volumes, um, these actually have been produced over a longer stretch of time. So they were, uh, all of these volumes, or most of these volumes, were donated by individual sponsors. Um, and I would say they were produced something between the 15th uh, and the 17th century. All of this dating is really to be taken with more than a grain of uh, salt. Um, I'm pretty sure about the relative uh, dating, though. And also, while kind of I, I, it looks like a very strict division between these three sets on the ground, it's much more messy. Yeah, we see that individual folios have been exchanged between these different sets. But I think it roughly looks like that. And then the second focus we have is on these um, boom volumes. We have 23 boom, vo boom volumes. Um, they are even more messy than the sutra volumes. I, my guess is they are from at least three different sets. It could be even more. And again, kind of being produced in a, in a, a spectrum between the 13th and the 16th centuries. And then other canonical material we find there is actually quite limited. There are only 13 other volumes which are other canonical materials. 
That is one getong, one Ashtasasika Prajna Paramita volume. There is one doxung, one uh, sutra, uh, one Dharani collection. There are four copies of the Vacha <clears throat> There are two volumes which are labeled as Q or as Tantra. And there are five volumes um, which are also Prajna Paramit uh, literature. And this is important, um, among these um, 13 you know, other canonical volumes, most of them have been produced much later than the Sutta volumes. So most of them are something past the 16th century in terms of production. And also two um, non-canonical volumes, one uh, Zenbum um, um, volume and one uh, Namta, one biography. So the point really is here, when we look at the Lang collection then, um, that there's a clear focus um, only on these two aspects, sutra volumes or sutra sets and bum sets. And this is the same um, focus, it's the same structure that we found in Namgyal. It's just that. And interestingly, um, we took uh, just a very brief look at these collections, but there are two other places. Um, one is Shea Monastery, also in Dolpur. And another one is a private collection in Saldang, also close to this area in Dolpur, um, where we find very similar collections. Collections <clears throat> that are made up entirely just of that. Sutra sets and boom sets. So I think uh, really kind of uh, my, my uh, guess is that what we have here is uh, that these are forms of uh, kind of a canon of uh, Tibetan literature um, that had been taking shape um, at a time um, prior um, to the time in the 15th century when uh, kind of this idea of a fully fledged kanja was introduced um, in this area. Um, and it also has, had continued um, this idea to live on um, rather long. Yeah, we have cases then where the kanja idea was more dominating and these sutras, sutra collections were integrated into kanjas. But we have also um, other places, like these two places I just quoted, uh, where these sutra sets um, were produced at later times. You know? The other uh, places, my rough guess would be um, these sutra uh, sets were produced in the 16th and 17th centuries. All right. Um, kind of in terms of a conclusion, uh, let me just kind of provide you with a very brief summary of the, the main issues. Um, <clears throat> it's very clear um, that these collections that we find in these um, Western and Central Himalayan borderlands, um, in these collections of Namgyal, Early Mustang, Lang, Hemis and Vasco, that these are not to be seen as local conjures or local connections but really definitely they are part of a larger texture network that stretches out between Ladakh, um, Dolpo and Mustang. And that's rather a rather extensive geographical area. I talked about these connections mostly in terms of structure and showing you all of these comparative graphs. Um, we could do also a more fine-grained textual analysis. Well, that's something that's actually much more boring to talk about. Um, but we did this, we, at least we probed into that, um, and we're also quite safe to say that we find uh, similarly close connections also on a textual level. So this we know for sure. Um, but there are also a couple of open questions which we would like to understand in a better way. Um, and this is, of course, um, how these collections, we know they are connected, but we don't know how exactly they are connected. We know how to roughly place them historically, but we don't understand exactly in kind of how to trace the textual relationships. Um, and of course, this is something for which a schematic analysis would be um, uh, one way of solution. But that's something I think eventually um, that we or someone should do. Um, <clears throat> then the other issue is that um, we have to uh, see which other collections could be connected to the network. I mentioned already these places um, in Saldang and in She. We find similar collections. Um, of course, also, um, we have to look um, at the other collections housed at uh, Nessa Gompa, the Nessa collections, and the Serkan collections. Um, and 
if then we are able to um, investigate more of these collections, I think it should also provide us with a more definitive answer to this question. Is it still possible that these collections are part of conjures? Or really are they, is it very clear that they are to be seen as a kind of independent canon that was there um, before the conjure? And then lastly, we need to investigate um, the relationships between this textual network, the Western uh, and Central Himalayan network, and then the um, Central Tibetan mainstream traditions, the texts um, of the Tsalpa and Tengpangma group. And there's one um, interesting study in that regard, a text critical, critical study um, of the Manchusha, Manchushri Vihara Sutra. It was done uh, by James Apple in 2014. And for that study, um, he compared, I think, 22 different uh, uh, conjures, witnesses of, textual witnesses of 22 different conjures, and used also material from, from Hemis and Basco. Um, and in his conclusion, um, he said it's safe to say that what we have in Hemis and Basco, that this is part of a separate Western Tibetan tradition. And he thinks also this is an, 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 a textual strata um, that is older than the textual strata that we see represented in the later Central Tibetan mainstream witnesses. This is just one single text, um, but of course it leads us to speculate um, if it's possible that really, you know, these uh, collections of 300 to 400 texts that we have here in the Himalayan borderlands, um, if it's possible that really they contain texts um, that are much older than the textual witnesses that we used um, so far. And again, that would be quite a sensation, right? Um, but again, that's something we can speculate about that, but uh, more research needs to be done in order to um, verify or to falsify the speculation. Right, and kind of with these kind of thoughts, um, I would like to conclude. Um, I thank you very much kind of for your patience and listening to all of that. Um, and really, I'm, I'm very curious in hearing your feedback and hearing your ideas on that. Thanks. Um, you mean the ones we, we digitized newly or the ones kind of we, all of them? Uh, kind of just to give an idea that they, or what's the difference in terms of methodology uh, or relationship. And all right. Because obviously it's an easier way or print, once printing comes in, I think tangent studies changes in a way. <laughs> Right. You see where I want to go? <laughs> right. Um, no, of course. Uh, I mean, I think that, I mean, the, the obvious uh, assumption is that it, it gets stabilized, yeah? Once you, yeah, because it's much more, it takes uh, much more work, of course, to, to um, order printing blocks. It costs much more money. Um, and then, of course, one version could be distributed and reproduced uh, many times, right? So kind of with, with the um, uh, usage of um, printing technology, of course, um, that's kind of a major um, stabilizing factor in, in, in Kanja studies. Um, I thought I had that here, but I, I, on the, there's one part of our website where we, we, we indicate what is a manuscript collection and what is a printed uh, collection, but I don't have that here. Um, <clears throat> So that, um, um, yeah, as I said, kind of this, this could um, explain uh, texture uh, variation, which uh, kind of could be bigger here in these um, borderland um, conjurers, right? Which were um, really, until recently, written by hand, right? I mean, they had uh, paper, um, um, paper making technology and everything quite sophisticated. Um, but um, printing technology then was introduced much later in these areas. Questions? I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm sort of very ignorant about all of this, but uh, two things in particular. I mean, 
talking about uh, handwritten collections and manuscripts, uh, the first question would be, is there any evidence of, um, how to say, similarities or dissimilarities in terms of layout? So leaving aside the contents, mm -hmm. what was exactly in, in the collection? But for example, the way that the page is presented, mm -hmm. the number of lines and this kind of thing. I'm talking from a Chinese perspective, for example, there was some kind of regularity in terms of how many columns and how many characters per column and this kind of thing, right? So even when the collection would be different, you could see that there was some kind of pattern behind you know, the idea of how the book should be conceived. Do we have anything like that again? Right. Um, there's actually um, there's one interesting study that should be published in a Braille volume rather soon um, by a Chinese, I think a Taiwanese student. I think his name is Shen Yu Li. Shen Yu Li or Shen Yu Lin. Uh, I can't remember clearly. But what he did is he, he did exactly that. Um, he investigated uh, kind of the, the format and the layout of different conjures, uh, printed conjures actually. Um, and it was quite interesting um, because I think no one ever did this before. And kind of the, the stemmer that he developed from looking into that was pretty similar to the, to the stemmer that we have kind of from a text critical analysis, from a, a philological analysis. Um, so that really is interesting. Um, what I noted, um, kind of, you know, I was, I was talking about um, kind of um, rather fine-grained textual differences. Um, so basically what I did is I, I, I take note whenever I find something weird when I do a catalog. Um, and I kind of, I, I try to see if the same weird thing is found in, in other catalogs. And there you find uh, all these kind of similarities. There would be a break off in a page. Uh, there would be a paragraph break, uh, a different design on one single page. And you could find these also kind of, you know, you could, you could see this mapped onto other collections which, um, you know, there's no other explanation than really that has been done by copying, right? I mean, there's no, there's no other logical explanation for doing that. Um, we find rather down to, to something kind of um, corrections, spelling mistakes, um, miscounting of individual chapters, something like that. So all of that is reproduced, yeah. Yeah. Well, the question, if I may, yeah. was about, uh, is there any particular reason that you can think of why uh, the Vila is a country less represented in this particular collection? <clears throat> I, th I think one, one immediate guess would yeah. be it has to do with uh, kind of the, the institutionalization, institu institu not getting the word, um, kind of, yeah, the kind of building up of institutions, yeah, that uh, um, one would assume that in this area that institutionalized Buddhism um, was not so strong that in other areas, right? And for that reason, then, um, the Vinaya, kind of a monastic uh, conduct, a monastic law, um, was not so important than in later times. And that's also quite interesting, really kind of in, in, Must, in Mustang, right, in that area, um, the kind of this major monasticism takes off then with kind of um, beginning of the 15th century. And of course, then that's when, you know, these patrons from central Tibet were invited, like Nguyen Chen. Um, you know, they build up these monasteries, but also they bring in these intellectual ideas. And with them, they bring in these other textual collections, like the Vinaya. So you don't think it's possible, perhaps, that the Vinaya was there orally? That, uh, it, the one that, um, that, that I think kind of, that the, the, that the Vinaya was there transmitted orally, uh, that uh, I think can be excluded. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure about that. It still could be that there are other collections uh, that were there in these places, but there's n there are no traces of them, right? It, it could be, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do all the pages have the circles or only the cover pages? No, uh, that's... Um, <clears throat> then when we study manuscripts, it's often mentioned as an ornamentation, but I think really it should be rather considered as, a, as kind of drawing the, the, the layout of a page. Um, <clears throat> so all of them have these circles. Um, and this, of course, a format, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, all of Tibetan Buddhism is uh, hugely inspired is drawing from Indian models, but it's kind of is one of these typical features that we see. Um, <clears throat> they have these punch marks um, 
here they're useless, right? Uh, you know what they were used for in former times, right? And they come, it comes from the Indian Boti format, um, from palm leaves, which uh, had a, a hole in the middle and then were, volumes were bound together with a string. Um, and then if you take a look in, at earlier Tibetan material, right? if you go back to like 12th century uh, manuscripts, you will see these are bigger. Sometimes they're also not ornamented, but there are bigger holes in there. Um, and we wonder if they were still in use. But at that time, really definitely, they were not in use anymore. You can't fit a string in there. Um, many of them also are not pierced anymore. And if you stack them on top of each other, it doesn't match. So it's just kind of this, you know, it's, it's remembering the, the Indian format. So uh, a follow-up as to how they're stored. So do they all have the ornamental wooden holes? Are those contemporary or are they later? Um, they, they have them. But then it's difficult to say kind of which, you know, there's also an exchange of boards. Because, yeah, this, as soon as you open a, a, a manuscript, you can exchange these things. And actually, Christian, you will uh, do research on kind of which board belongs to which volume, right? The boards were actually mixed up, which is a certain problem. But of course, since we have a huge collection, it, there is no way around that there must be boards that belong to that collection. And uh, the suspicion is that a relative, uh, one group, one relatively big group of words in Namgyal is uh, just ornamented on one side, one front side, uh, with quite nice early carvings and has otherwise just uh, red paint on the outside. But that is the one that belongs to this early collection. Uh, but I don't, they don't have volume sweat signatures as later ones, mm -hmm. so we can't reconstruct kind of which volume really belongs to. Uh, and so in that sense, but I look into it more for, for the Paris mm. friends, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I was more interested in knowing about the, the dating strategy you performed, <coughs> like, for several set of sutras you say the set is from the 13th mm -hmm. century mm -hmm. and the, the other set is from 14th to 15th. Is it only like geographical difference or or like a, you can find out in Metadata or like Hong Kong or mm -hmm. it's from that century. It's like, it's like only a difference of one century yeah. from you. It's really something um, I, I should emphasize. Um, you, know, you, you can't take all, any of these dates for granted. Um, for once, uh, because I'm just starting with this type of research, yeah, that's something that needs a lot of uh, experience. You need to take a look at um, a lot of different material in order to get a, kind of a better grasp of that. Um, <clears throat> but I kind of by the time, I've just, you know, I'm talking about one and a half years looking at these manuscripts, but I've looked at several ten thousands of folios of manuscripts. Um, and I kind of I feel one, one gets a better understanding, um, at least about the relative dating. About the absolute date, I'm kind of, I'm, I still accept there could be shifts. Um, <clears throat> for dating, we could basically, there's a couple of things we can do, right? Uh, we can um, do a C14 analysis. Um, that's something um, we have not done so far for uh, various reasons. One reason, is of course because that's uh, it's important, religiously important material that we document on the site, um, and that's not a good place to, you know, chop off a piece of the manuscript, um, especially if we're not very sure what we want to achieve by that. Um, <clears throat> but I think in future, kind of, that will be an aspect that we would like to include. Um, perhaps by kind of you know, trying to collect things that fall apart anyway. But that's something I'm, I feel I'm quite hesitant about that. Um, and also we should uh, be clear about, you know, if we do C14 dating, what it gets us is uh, usually for that period, uh, a period of 200 years with a, with a kind, of a reliability, kind of reliability curve, right? But really it's 200 years. I'm also sure about 200 years. <laughs> uh, there, there's no question about that. So that's, it's something I think it should be considered additionally, but one also has to be clear about the limitations of that. Yeah? It, it will not give you a precise date just because there's a kind of natural science background to it. Um, and then... It's already 200 years. It's 
it's just for a certain century, right. for a right. certain period, especially, I think, right. because you look into 11th century, 12th century, it's, it's not a good time <coughs> for a sequel. Right. Uh, a little later, it's better, and then it becomes bad again for a while. So right. it's, it really depends where you want to be in with sequel theme yeah. and on, the, on how the curve is actually running that it's calibrated against, yeah. We have, um, I think so far, the, the most precise um, system of dating is really looking to colophones. Mm -hmm. But they also, you, you expect more, you hope for more, <laughs> for more reliable historical information. We will read through a colophone on a seminar and on Saturday, you will see they're not so precise as one wishes for. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, that, that would, could be an, uh, I think in kind of more precise dating, I think that would be the one of the key um, systems. And then I really think, um, and again, specifically for this uh, time frame, I think a closer investigation of um, paleographical developments um, will also kind of give us a clearer estimation of date. But that's something that for that period has uh, not been done so far. Features that he has shown, and the lesser archaic features that occur, yeah. the, the later you make it. <laughs> yeah, the that's the. <clears throat> is, that's kind of, this, uh, kind of simplified. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you know, the, as I said, kind of, we, we find all of these features next to each other. And then, kind of, by the degree of, you know, something is there very often or not so often, we kind of get an estimation where it could be placed. Um, <clears throat> what I think, what I hope for, um, that kind of these um, paleographic considerations uh, that we will be able to establish uh, a more clear cut of date because there's a clear shift, I think, I would like to argue for that, <clears throat> between an, an, a certain way of early writing and a later form of writing. I think that this shift happened some, sometime between the 14th and the 15th century. So yeah. Yeah, that's earlier, that's later. And that's 15th century, and I think that's 14th century. Um, <clears throat> but again, then, again, if there, you know, I think there's, there's a cut, there's a division to be, uh, to be established. But then it doesn't tell us anything about afterwards. Yeah, 16th century, we would have uh, other problems then. And, and 13th century, because the writing didn't change much between uh, kind of the, the 12th to the 14th century. Yeah. It actually shows quite nicely how how well trained they were in writing this. It's so, these letters are so similar to yeah. each other. Yeah. So it's, uh, and uh, through the entire collection, through all the letters almost, it's quite remarkable. Yes. You told us about, uh, very interesting talk, thank you very, very much, mm. um, but you're telling us about the pedagraphic features of the Kuchen script. But I can see on the manuscript that you've got Ule there on the door of the uh, yeah. pictures. Now, my, what I, I, mean, I can't read it because you're far away, but my interest was whether there's anything in comparison between those, the two scripts that are actually on the manuscript that we've taken. That would be my, my first question. <clears throat> are you. What sample of that? <coughs> Are you talking about these things yeah, here? That, that, that's Ume, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, that's a form of Ume. Um, <clears throat> we find um, yeah, different notes on these manuscripts. The thing is, um, I'm, I must re say, I, I don't know anything about the development of Ume during that time. Um, and I think hardly anyone knows anything <laughs> about that. Um, it's kind of uh, what I, I have some uh, kind of an estimation of you know, what is a bit earlier, what is a bit later. Um, I think many of the, the comments you see there in Ume are added later. We see also um, um, kind of notes added in Uchen. Um, you see a note here, yeah? Tangshi de Dago. It has been revised and is proper now. 
So that's that's uh, that's a part of making uh, producing a manuscript, a manuscript collection, a proper revision process. And I assume that kind of we we have these um, Uchen comments, Uchen notes. Uh, these are part of this proper uh, revision process, textual corrections, and they are all over these manuscripts. Um, and I would tentatively assume that the other notes here they are from a later stage. But when exactly? It's difficult I've, for me. I, yeah, I, I don't know. How, do you have an? I can kind of confirm that I study the the illuminations in relation to their descriptions, and it's very clear that these have been added to it, not by the same people, and not knowing always what it actually depicted, which is quite interesting. It's kind of a reinterpretation, so apparently things got lost in between, and then somebody decided to add uh, the identifications to it, but they weren't always correct, so they, they are not they're not from, definitely not from the same time. They wouldn't help in this case. Uh, but yeah, uh, Ume is sometimes used in other manuscripts, handwritten ones. Namgil has a fantastic Sakya manuscript collection in Ume, for example. Also. The, but that is much more, again, canonized in a way uh, in terms of handwriting. Yeah. You see also, just kind of, as I was looking for that before, you see kind of Slight forms of Ume influence in there. Yeah, that would be the other form. But I think that, that's really a different thing. That's part of these um, horizontal ligatures of this kind of writing. Mm -hmm. But clearly the manuscript itself has been, has been lined, you know, presumably for the scribe to yeah. actually yeah. You know, keep his line. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it's obviously an original. Uh, it's obviously the way that they're doing it. But, but it, it, you know, it's but you can see the who made that. But like, were there any other scripts there? Did you find any Ma anywhere? Any, any Ma? The, 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 um, the, the sort of, um, that you find in Kamachakra sort of symbol? You find all sort of things, yeah? You find um, 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 seals, for example, you find drawings, you find notes um, in, in Ume or different types of Ume or Yukik, um, whatever. Um, kind of. Let's take a little bit of text and just copy it yeah. underneath. <laughs> From there's all kinds of stuff is on this. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of, I mean, you, you, you can see, um, you can basically see that these manuscripts were in use, right? Um, you can see that they were touched. You can see that they were recited. You can kind of see where they were touched. Um, you can see, um, I will be talking about that in Paris, about these notes. Um, you can kind of see um, how people interact with books. Um, you can see sometimes they were used to drop a note to a colleague. You know, could be, you know, things we do, yeah. Um, you can see they were used as writing material, as kind of training writing, training the alphabet, um, training copying. Kind of copy, it's very commonly found uh, kind of copying phrases from the text below. Um, I think you can also make a point um, that uh, this is done on that side. Yeah, when you sit down and recite a text, you have one facing towards you and not the other one. And there you have more, more notes than on the other side. So this, you, can, if you could see how people work with these texts. Yeah. Related to that, I have another question. If you look at the, uh, the pagination before the pagination, there is sang in this case, which is an abbreviation of yeah. the title, uh, which is starts with Bakba San and so on. Yeah. So, so they use the first or one or two syllables from the title to indicate on the margin where, which text you are in, which was for me when I started kind of cataloging yeah. that was very extremely useful because I could just check for that mark. And when it changed, I knew I have to check for the new beginning of the new text. But this, for me, it was the first time that I even saw that. How frequent is that? I, I, can't, I can't actually tell, kind of, because I never looked at it in, in a comparative perspective. Yeah. Um, but I think this is found in other, in other instances as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. One last question before. It's more of a comment. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that these texts show signs of being used quite considerably. 
because certainly um, some contemporary llamas complain these days that nobody ever looks at the kangaroo anymore. So uh, that's quite interesting. When, when, when <laughs> When, when use, I mean, really, I do not mean they were studied, right? Uh, we, can, we can also see traces of studying, right? We can find, for example, um, annotational remarks, but these are rather limited. Um, but rather, rather, I think they were used in, in a ritual context of reciting these texts. So it's usually once a year that they recite the entire thing, but that's it. And sometimes in Mustang they also carry it around the village <laughs> to protect the village. Uh, that's essentially the two main usages of, uh, of these collections. But what I find uh, interesting, especially about the question of if they are distinctive collections, if we look at whatever the, the historical information that we have from the West Tibet, early mm. Purambuga kingdom and so on, is that they, besides establishing the temple, they established, or they, they co had certain text corpuses copied. Mm. And they had kind of, they listed in a way as if they would be independent. Mm. And so the question is how much does that relate to, to that habit that essentially when you found the temple, you have to also have the word of the Buddha there, the minimum is some prajna paramita, some yeah. boom, and then if you have more means, of course, you may add to that. Yeah, I mean, also these findings, yeah, where we we have clearly kind of collections that are different from conjures. Um, <clears throat> these kind of um, draw new light to these Western Tibetan collections, yeah. right? Uh, for example, in in Basco, uh, we know there is one kanja, but it's, it has been compiled as a kanja only in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It were separate collections before, right? So only then kind of the, the kanja idea became so strong that people you know, would piece that together. Um, so one could, of course, also try to undo that again to see kind of which pieces were there before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>